But all right. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much to uh, to our last speaker, Matthew. Uh, Woo! And, uh, yes. And uh, once the appropriate buttons are pressed, uh, we'll have uh, we'll have Jeff Lindsay talking to you. Um, and then uh, after that, I, uh, I I trust we have our uh, panel folks here in Squared Away. All right. Raise your hand if you're on the panel. All right. Well, there's two some, of them. Some so. of them are getting coffee, and then there's a panelist who just touched down in Austin and is coming in. Oh, he's, oh, he's right there. Sweet. Nice. All right. Well, just uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, gather you all together afterwards. But uh, uh, until then, we give you into the able hands, Jeff Lindsay. Thank you. Can you guys hear me all right? I don't know if this is picking up my voice. I guess I need to be looking this way. Yeah, it probably is. Okay. Ah, cool. How many of you guys are from Austin? Yeah, Container Day is Austin. I'm from Austin. Well, I'm not from, I live in Austin. Uh, I'm from the Bay Area. By the way, bold move doing a security talk as the first thing in the morning. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, CoreOS has been doing some really great stuff. Um, I remember hanging out with them when they were in their garage and they had an intern writing at CD. Um, and actually, uh, so I've kind of been uh, in this cont container stuff for a while, sort of at ground zero with Docker, um, sort of putting together that project and then doing a bunch of stuff in this space. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Glider Labs. Um, it's sort of not, you know, we're not VC funded or anything, but we've, we've done a lot of stuff <clears throat> in the Docker ecosystem. We brought Alpine to the Docker ecosystem. Uh, we wrote Logspout, uh, Registrator, a handful of a bunch of other really uh, handy things in the Docker ecosystem. And uh, so, you know, it seemed like it would be a good idea to uh, it'd be fun to give a talk here, and it seemed like given kind of what everything else that was is going on here, we're sort of talking about cluster managers now. We're kind of over containers a little bit. We're kind of working up the stack and talking about you know container orchestration and stuff. And this is something that I'd been thinking about since you know kind of uh, before Docker and going into Docker, uh, and most of the people in the space have. Um, and so I figured I would kind of give you uh, a tour of kind of what's going on in, in uh, these cluster managers, sort of um, boil it down to the essentials so it doesn't seem that scary. And part of this is because cluster managers are very hard, they're very complex, and a lot of people don't need them. And a lot of what Glider Labs has been doing for clients is a lot of low-tech stuff that addresses those same concerns uh, in a much simpler way. Um, and actually, if I could uh, get a show of hands, how many of you uh, know how many servers you run run more than 100 servers? And these can be VMs. Okay. How many run less than 50? It seems, well, of the people, uh, so, so I guess between 50 and 100? Okay, well, this is very odd. I can't really figure out what you guys are. But um, uh, most people aren't running at the scale that a lot of these cluster managers are kind of uh, marketing for a big enterprise. Um, and so, uh, but, but that said, I think the cluster manager abstraction is really important, so I wanted to kind of talk about this. This is not a very a terribly technical talk. Um, it provides perspectives uh, uh, on this. And there's also a little bit of a, a, a rant. Glider Labs is not in like the cluster manager game. Um, but, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I just made this up, kind of thinking about this in the history, and you probably heard maybe the history of stuff like Borg and influence on Kubernetes. Um, but it, it kind of, you know, I was thinking back, um, kind of the, the progression, because uh, I was kind of there for a lot of these, and there seems like these kind of three distinct eras in how we kind of think about servers and server management. Um, and the current one that we're kind of getting into is something that Google's been doing for a long time. Um, and we're, we're now just getting the tools to really have a general purpose cluster manager. 
when you talk about like clusters and and sort of like a, as a collection of servers, um, and there's been cluster managers that are sort of specialized um, for certain things, but we're getting to the point where we actually have pretty good general purpose cluster managers to the point where we almost call them like a distributed operating system or an operating system for the OS. And the point of this um, sort of a new paradigm is really not treating hosts as uh, really individual things, but treating the cluster aggregate as a whole as your, uh, as your server, basically. And uh, so kind of these three distinct phases kind of go back. Um, they're all about 10 years apart. And the one that we're all pretty familiar with, I call transitional. But I made all this up. But if you'll humor me, um, how many of you have been working in the space since 1995? Yeah. So an interesting thing about 1995 is that's when SSL 2.0 came out. And we had uh, an actual secure way to do transactions on the internet. And so that's when the commercialization of the internet really took off. And that's when things really changed to uh, actually mattering when your servers are down. And so uh, you know, a lot of people were running stuff at the time you know, on, on fairly uh, you know, this sort of scale vertically. Um, people were used to having one server. And now for redundancy, maybe they'd have two. Um, and actually, and this is kind of interesting, so my, I was 10 at the time. But my dad, uh, the year before, started an ISP and hosting company. And so I've sort of grew up with this stuff. And uh, one of the things that he marketed was he found some Cray supercomputers at a, at a liquidation uh, sale. And so he started marketing, host your website on a supercomputer. <laughs> and uh, so uh, and these servers you know, were, were long lived. You kind of, they needed to be up. They needed to sort of um, be there. And we, today, we call this like treating them like pets. Um, and then what the sort of the beginning of transitional was around 2005, which is also around um, basically right when Web 2.0 really took off. And we, um, you know, that was, we had wikis, we had social, we had Flickr. And actually, um, <clears throat> did any of you read the book um, Building Scalable Websites by Cal Henderson? That's a, a fairly uh, influential book that came out at the time. He was uh, one of, uh, I think, a uh, lead engineer at Flickr. And they were really pioneering a lot of what would become known as DevOps and, uh, and those kinds of uh, best practices. But there was a lot of other stuff that was going on around then. EC2 came out. Um, and so that was sort of the birth of like modern cloud computing. And that also started forcing people to start thinking a little bit differently. Um, Google was already ahead of the game. Um, and so they couldn't even really compete with EC2 because they didn't really have that same kind of infrastructure. They already had a cluster manager. And they were like, well, we can build uh, something on top of that. So that's, they came out with App Engine in 2007 and sort of invented um, Pass. And it all feeds back into each other. Um, uh, that's a sort of the long, the, the long version. But some of the things that we got from this are thinking about scaling horizontally. Right, using cheap commodity hardware, uh, which also is a big, uh, Google had a big influence uh, on that. And you know, infrastructure as code and all these sort of dev DevOpsy things. But we still kind of more or less treat, you know, we use configuration management and automate a lot of managing these servers, but we still kind of manage them uh, individually in some form. Um, and so, you know, 2015, I think, is when. Um, you know, Kubernetes, the Docker has been out, had been out for a little bit, and Kubernetes came out, and you know, talk of Docker Swarm. And so now we're starting coming into this new era, um, and it's, I think, totally different than than uh, the way we did things before, which is why I don't um, use any kind of configuration management. Um, so another way to look at these, if we were using that pet metaphor, maybe we have, and this is. I know a lot of people don't keep cows as pets, but uh, it's for the theme of the slide. So, you know, talking about pets, and then we started talking about cattle. Uh, you know, treating servers as cattle. You know, it's not so much that you you, you know you're you're going to want to like name them and and that they're so special. They're part of you know this group. Um, you know, and they kind of rotate out, and you're kind of more thinking about the collective. 
unfortunately, this metaphor doesn't really extend into this new area without getting a little bit um, depressing. <laughs> but this is, you know, the closest I could come up with. But luckily, um, you know, this is not a problem with servers. Uh, you know, we don't really care about, uh, you know, uh, free range servers. <laughs> so, so, you know, I think this all kind of started uh, with Docker, and I know there are a lot of other people doing stuff at the same time, uh, you know, thinking about containers and such. Um, and, uh, and but when Docker came out, that was really the point at where there's a sort of Cambrian explosion of activity in the space, which has, you know, as much as it's exciting, it's it's annoying as hell, right? Um, so there's tons of tech, you know, more than are on here. Um, some of this stuff doesn't make sense to me. Um, and in fact, slides like this, which I didn't make, I stole. Um, to me, are actually kind of useless, other than proving the point that these slides are quite, kind of useless. Here's another one, and here's another one. And I don't know why people like making these slides. They're totally useless. Um, so, but you know, part of what uh, caused all these companies to, to come out was, okay, we had Docker, but we a lot of people were like, well, you know, it gave us a hint of like maybe thinking in terms of like a cluster manager and stuff, but it wasn't, right? It's just Docker engine. And so a lot of people were like, Docker is not enough, and there are a lot of ways that Docker is not enough. Um, Some even felt so strongly they gave a talk titled Docker is not enough. Um, and the point is that it, you know, Docker, um, when, when, when I was involved, it wasn't really, uh, and, and to Solomon too, you know, it was meant to be a building block, um, and it was part of my effort to disaggregate pass. Um, so platform services, I think, are quite amazing, um, and so I was on a, a mission to sort of break it down into um, uh, decoupled components. And one of those primitives that you could build a pass with would be a, a, a container manager. And uh, so disaggregation is, is a term that I've been using recently. Um, and you might think it's kind of like you know, taking a, mo a monolithic thing and turning it into microservices, um, which there is it's, you know, maybe a more generalized version of that. It actually, I stole it from Facebook. They, they talk about disaggregation um, when they're, sort of re they're actually trying to reinvent a lot of um, hardware technologies in the data center. And, um, you know, I say the point of disaggregation is being able to advance the individual system components independently of the system, um, which is doing, uh, I guess, good things for them. But I think it's even more important in software, where complexity can just so easily just skyrocket. So I think it's imperative that we, that we have better building blocks. Um, we need to take systems. Uh, complex systems, disaggregate them into simpler uh, domains, and build orthogonal building blocks that kind of let you throw stuff together. Um, it was brought up in the last talk, we're bad at writing software. Um, so the less software we write, the better. And the best way to not write software is to build on top of really great primitives. So the problem is, is that our industry is not really incentivized to build building blocks, good building blocks, right? Small, focused, uh, orthogonal, composable building blocks. Um, part of this is because most of the money in the industry is actually going to companies that are sort of forced to sell to enterprises and people that are really looking for solutions. And solutions are very different than building blocks. Um, this is kind of what the ideal solution scenario. You have a very clear picture of what your problem is, which most people don't in the first place. And then they find something that exactly fits it, um, which is definitely not the case. It actually looks a lot more like this. <laughs> and you know, ultimately, you might just need, I don't know, we could grab that can opener. I think we need a corkscrew. There's uh, maybe a knife, one of the many 
maybe that thing, because it's it looks cool. Uh, but oh, you know what? We need fingernail clippers, and I just don't. Maybe they're in there, but uh, so I'll, you know, have someone go off and do some research, find another vendor solution that that you know has our fingernail clippers, and they come back and they're like, here. <laughs> Where are the fingernail? Oh, they're right there. Okay. Okay. So now we have everything that we need, right? Uh, I guess we'll just, you know, and, and, and you know, part of this is, is what's, what's sad is that the vendors behind both of these two things don't know anything about this, right? Um, you know, to them, people are just using their, their, uh, their software. Um, and it's, you know, the end users, the um, uh, system integrators that, that see the reality of this. Um, and the other problem is everybody's trying to kind of win, right? All the vendors are trying to do everything. Um, and so it, <laughs> this might be an exaggeration, but this is how it feels, right? And of course, Docker is uh, not at all an exception to this, um, unfortunately. And I call this um, the system software mess. Uh, and I don't know what the solution is. I'm finding ways to build uh, good uh, building blocks. And, and so, you know, I, but <laughs> we'll see. I don't know if it's sustainable. Um, anyway, um, so a lot of these people are going after that cluster manager abstraction because it is the future. I think that's the way, you know, even at a small scale, that's kind of how we're going to think about computing. Um, but the a general purpose cluster manager is really hard, and part of why it's hard is it's a distributed system. In fact, it manages a distributed system in a lot of cases. And it turns out distributed systems are inherently complex. And you know, we talk about writing bad software. To me, that's sort of like adding complication, or you, know, you don't understand a domain well enough to boil it down to its essentials. Um, but then there is inherent complexity that you just can't really um, uh, get out of. And just to give you an example of um, you know, how much the distributed systems part uh, is in, in complexity, here are two open source Heroku clones, open source projects. Um, uh, both I had something to do with. but uh, And th these numbers are not accurate anymore, but the proportion is, is correct. The difference between these is Doku is for a single host, where Flynn is for you know full distributed system, and and but they're both they can both run Heroku apps to give you the same workflow, same management. In fact, Doku is a great example, um, and I made it by accident. I made it as a demo for a talk in uh, one of the first talks on Docker on what you can do with Docker, and it was originally 65 lines of Bash. And that was possible by leveraging good primitives, good components like Docker, like um, Nginx, and a couple of other things that I had to make for this, but were general purpose. Um, and this is really powerful. And we, you know, we can't just we can't throw stuff together. Unfortunately, it's just too complicated. Um, but that's the world I want to live in, where you can throw this stuff together. So. Um, disaggregating uh, pass, you know, led to all this container stuff. And now it turns out that uh, a lot of what I've been doing is kind of disaggregating cluster managers because it turns out, and this, if you do, you guys remember this? This was from Container Days. Uh, was that last year or the year before? Um, a friend of mine, Gabriel Monroy, gave this talk. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know he's coming, trying to come up with a way to kind of categorize everything that's going on in this space. Um, Almost like the slides in the beginning, but a little bit more technical. And you know it's technical because it has layers. Um, <laughs> but uh, so we don't really, you know, we're kind of over the container engine stuff, operating system, you know, core OS, great. Um, so this leaves this other stuff. One of the things that um, uh, Gabriel kind of uh, basically the most useful thing in this to me was the fact that pass is actually a very thin layer of workflow automation on top of a cluster manager. So a cluster manager does most of the work. 
But I do have a problem with the rest of this because I really hate the term orchestration. Um, and scheduling is just so ambiguous. You don't really have scheduling without orchestration. And these examples are, conf you know, really to me, this is just like, just call it a cluster manager. And um, there we go. I fixed it. <laughs> so what the hell is a cluster manager? I mean, you've done you know, Kubernetes, and you've, you've probably played with Swarm and stuff now. Um, but what I want to explain are basically the primitives that you would want in order to throw together a cluster manager. And this is really just to give you a sense of the domain, what's specific to cluster managers, um, and maybe also uh, show you that they're not that scary. Um, so prerequisite building blocks. The obvious one is a container engine. And this is actually really important, because what Docker does is, um, and this was touched on in Matthew's talk a little, but it gives us, it gives us like a unit of software, and it turns a host into a host for those units of software with an API, right? If you think about like what, what is software? Um, but you know, if you if you look at, at a Linux system, like how do you, can you point your finger at like a piece of software, right? It's like. Well, there's the binary. There's some configuration all over. There's also the process that's running, which is somewhere in this process hierarchy. Um, and then your API to that is the shell and SSH. And so, you know, this w one of the great things about containers is not really about containers. It's about this new level of abstraction that's allowing us to sort of reinvent, um, you know, the world of software um, and make it more software driven you know, having APIs and such. So we needed that. We have that. Good. Distributed coordination. I'm sure a lot, you're mostly familiar with this by now. Console, etcd, zookeeper, doozer. Um, so these are just kind of great to have handy sort of Swiss Army knife, uh, the good kind, um, that you can use for distributed uh, systems because it's just so handy to have uh, distributed locks and kind of key value stuff. And it's just a really powerful primitive. So we have those two. Now what? So the whole thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to take a bunch of hosts, and we want to aggregate them into effectively a single unit, right, the cluster. So the first step is we need to know what hosts we have. And so I'll call this like inventory your hosts. So this is centralizing all the information about the hosts. Um, and you know, what this covers, uh, you know, it could be what, what the hardware specs are, uh, what operating system it's running, metadata, what network it's on, um, but also dynamic data like resource utilization, um, and ideally any other metadata that you want to put on these things. Um, and What's interesting is, is if you had a tool that aggregated all of that in one place that let you do queries and stuff, that's actually quite powerful. And we don't really have that primitive. Maybe OS query, and this is baked into things like Ansible and Chef, but you don't have it as a standalone building block, which is really annoying because cluster managers need this too. If you just had this and sort of fed it into a parallel SSH, you already have something really powerful. And EC2, if you're, if you're running on EC2, um, you know, you get kind of half of this for free. You get a lot of information about um, your hosts, um, and you have an API that gives you a list of them. So, uh, you know, it's kind of easy to throw together a sort of uh, pretty good cluster manager on EC2 just because they already have an API that gives you a sort of inventory. Um, so now you have, like, a, a, if you put that information in one place, you now have a model of your cluster, the state of the cluster, right? And so we're going to use this in, in the next step. Um, but first, we need this concept of a unit of compute, right? We, we need to somehow describe the computation that we're going to do. The, the, uh, classically, this is referred to as a job, right? And um, containers really gave us like a good sort of unit that we can work with. Um, and so. But sometimes you need multiple containers. And so this is why you see um, things like Docker Compose and uh, Kubernetes pods, 
And that's sort of the unit of compute. It's a way to describe what you want this cluster to do. And now after that, it's just a matter of like giving that to a cluster, and it's going to basically it just has to decide where to run them. Um, so this is referred to as placement or scheduling, which is borrowing sort of the metaphor uh, for um, you know, operating system and kernel scheduler um, allocating resources. And really, all this is doing is deciding where it needs to put them. And that's really the heart of what a, a, a cluster manager is doing. Everything else is kind of extra, or at least I would argue is, mo is extra in the sense that um, they, they can just be kind of extra um, orthogonal concerns. Um, so that's it. No. Um, you know, this doesn't cover like job recovery, what happens when they fail, how do they communicate, like lots of good problems, right? Though what I just described is more or less what Docker Swarm was originally. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, they made a, a, a number of uh, mistakes with this, um, one of which was assuming that the API for jobs is the same as containers, and it doesn't because, to me, there's fundamentally uh, two job types that you can run on a cluster. Um, the one that we think about most often are services or long-running processes like your app servers, but also commands, or I call them commands, or batch processes. And these are things that basically start and stop. They don't run indefinitely. And these are just as important as services. Um, and pretty much every paper you read on scheduling is going to talk about these two things because they do have implications in terms of your scheduling algorithms, but they, have all, they also have huge implications in terms of the API and the user experience, um, as well as extra services that you need in your cluster manager. For example, services uh, need supervision. Right? You can't just say, restart the service. If the, whole, if the host goes down, uh, you need it to start up uh, another one of those services on another host. So something else needs to be supervising uh, services from different machines. Um, logs, also uh, replication. Services very often, you know, scaling horizontally, you want to run X number of them. <coughs> um, whereas a command has none of those concerns, and also it might have different concerns, right? You might want to, it might be interactive. You might want to uh, attach to it and interact with it. You might need a pseudo terminal, right? So these are very important things to have in your cluster manager model. And this is something Swarm didn't, it kind of had implicitly in the original Swarm. The new Swarm mode doesn't support commands. Uh, it's quite ridiculous. And Kubernetes for a while didn't have um, commands. I don't know the state of that now. But to talk about service supervision, and this is kind of where some of the, you know, people talk about scheduling, but this is kind of where uh, I think a lot of the magic is, and it's not even that complicated. <laughs> um, in Kubernetes, this is, they'd call it the uh, replica controller. That's kind of the role of, of that component. Um, and its job is mostly about uh, rescheduling, uh, effectively re restarting a process somewhere else in the cluster, um, and ensuring there's X replicas running. And so people talk about ideal state, right? You need, uh, you want to define the state that you want your cluster to be in, and the system will work to keep it in that state. Um, which, by the way, is a very old concept. It's how configuration management systems work. Um, it's also how your thermostat works. Um, State-seeking systems, cybernetics, it's pretty old. It's also very simple. It's based on feedback loops. And autoscale groups work the same way. In fact, if you were to generalize autoscale groups on EC2, to be able to kind of work on services, you could use that for service supervision. Um, and one of the reasons why I don't list this in sort of like the heart of a cluster manager is because you could run this on top of a cluster manager. You could run a service supervision service. You could run two of them. They monitor each other so that if one of them goes down, they're always running. And given you ha have a, a coordination primitive, they can decide who is sort of the master and in charge of watching all the other processes. Um, and then it's sort of like, you know, it's not necessarily part of the cluster manager. Kubernetes comes close to this model. Um, but for example, Swarm just bakes this into the manager, which is really annoying because, again, this is a really great general purpose primitive. It's what auto scale groups is. You could use this for all kinds of great stuff. We don't have a general purpose primitive for this. <clears throat> 
And there's basically a whole list of other orthogonal concerns that you definitely have when you're dealing with cluster manager and you want a solution, right? But all of these, I argue, are quite orthogonal. I've spent a lot of time uh, in the Docker world with service discovery and figuring out how to do that um, very sort of magically, automatically. And uh, the opinionated ways that Kubernetes and other cluster managers have decided to do it kind of blows all that work away. Um, health checks, all this stuff kind of feeds into each other. Um, but uh, if we look at, and this is, I think this is from the new stack, and I don't remember how long ago, but um, uh, these are kind of what most people are using, and you'll notice that it adds up to more than 100. This was pointed out to me the other day. And it's because people do end up using more than one of these. I almost had a slide that was talking about running Kubernetes on top of Mesos, which is just ridiculous. Um, and I can understand that there is a situation where it makes sense that you had to duct tape them together. Um, but the amount of complexity that you're, you're, you're introducing, and they're sort of both achieving the same thing. But that's the world that we live in. Um, so anyway, you should be able to throw together a cluster manager. If I had more time, I would love to uh, kind of talk about some of the low-tech things that we did with clients. Um, and, uh, uh, but you know, otherwise, you know, hopefully this is just, at, at the very least, inspiring. Um, and this is, and like I said, Collider Labs is not in sort of the cluster manager game. Uh, maybe in some way we'll sort of uh, get involved, but um, I'd, I'd really like to, to somehow figure out a way to stop building these and, and start building more of these. And um, so anyway, that's kind of what Glider Labs is doing. Um, and we're kind of, I kind of, because of all the noise, we're sort of m moving away from the container specific space and starting to build cool primitives on top of it. The reason why I wanted containers and cluster managers was to build really cool stuff on top of that. So that's what we're focusing on now. Um, if I had time, I would give you a, a demo of a, a new service that gives you commands as a service. So you can basically say, if there's, I think I have time. Um, well, maybe I, I, <laughs> I don't have uh, internet. Um, well, you know what? Tell you what, we'll we'll do an open spaces talk on Command I/O, and we'll give you the full demo. Um, but just to sort of uh, describe what it does, um, it's an it's oddly it's an SSH service. You SSH, it looks like this. You can say SSH, Command I/O, and anything you want. Basically, you can install these commands, which are basically Docker containers. This is the JQ one, and you can use that from anywhere. So you get commands as a service, utilities as a service, but you can also configure them um, with environment variables similar to Heroku apps, which means you can put Terraform on here and create a Terraform deployment service or any Ansible, whatever you want, put this on command IO, and then you can also share access to it with other people. So they don't have to install anything. They don't have to have any credentials. You have it set it up as a service, sort of as if you set it up as an API, but it's just a bunch of bash scripts or whatever in a container, and it's usable over SSH. And so there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with this um, that we're still figuring out, um, that all the cool things that we can do with it. So that's you know a pretty uh, cool primitive that we're working on. It's also open source and all that. So um, if you're interested in that, we will be giving an open spaces talk. I don't know in one slot. We'll have to figure it out. But um, otherwise, if you're interested in that, you can join our Slack uh, and find this uh, command CMD channel um, and, and ask for access to it. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, thanks for letting me talk about cluster managers and rant a little about the industry with you. Do we get um, questions, or is there time? It doesn't have to be about anything I talked about. You can ask me about anything. Oh, yeah. 
So you mentioned about composing and the Lego ideas and solutions, but I thought from what I've heard from Kubernetes community is that that's what they're trying to do with the API server and yep. the primitives that they're building yep. and being a pluggable uh, architecture, oh, yeah. which I think has departed very much from how like Swarm has approached. So maybe comments on that. Um, Kubernetes is like the is the closest. Um, it's actually really frustrating to me when people make like the like the almost perfect things, like everything I want, but, um, and Kubernetes is definitely the closest in all of my ideals in, in what I want. I have a cluster manager both in community, philosophy, all this stuff. Um, they're missing a, a couple of things. One, there's a, there's a certain amount of opinionated stuff that they put into it that's kind of annoying. Um, I don't want half the stuff that they put into it and make you use. Um, but it is, you know, pluggable and stuff like that, which is uh, really great. But it's also just very complex and trying to solve a lot of problems for a lot of people, most of which are, are not the common case, um, sort of people with, like, relatively small clusters. Um, so a lot of the time it's not worth um, actually running. It's definitely it's a huge uh, improvement over Mesa, <coughs> um, which I won't even, like, get near. And uh, it's definitely sort of more thought out and f fully fun functional than, um, uh, than Swarm. And actually, I didn't mention this, but ECS I actually really like. It's a bummer that it's software as a service. But on EC2, it's actually, it, it, to me, is almost the ideal because it does the bare minimum uh, of what I want from a, a cluster manager. Um, so I, I like Kubernetes. And it may become the standard thing. But, and you'll notice it's, it has a lot of activity. Like It's one of the most popular projects right now in terms of like contributions and all this. The problem with that is that like most of that is adding complexity, adding features, you know, fixing things for sure. But open source generally is additive. And without a clear definition of scope, it's sort of unbounded. And cluster manager is a really hard thing to really scope, which is kind of part of why I talk about this. Um, but because it's unbounded, like who knows how complex it's going to be, um, ultimately. But I like it. You you kind of mentioned this briefly when you mentioned uh, using Mesos to do Kubernetes. Uh, that seems to be pretty popular right now. Is you know any one of those three swarm Kubernetes Mesos orchestrating one one another, and then also in the OpenStack there's running. Uh, Kubernetes with OpenStack using Magnum, or there's even worse, running OpenStack on Kubernetes. What are your thoughts around that? Is it is there really ever a good reason to do it? Like, if, it, maybe if you have like some big mythical scale or something. But other than that, I mean, the only reason that it, it makes sense is that you have requirements that none of them <laughs> satisfy, and you have to run both. Or in some cases, people uh, already had Mesos, but they need they wanted stuff on Kubernetes, and so it's like, well, you know. I mean, ideally, you only have one cl root cluster manager. So, and then you have things like uh, CoreOS was talking about. You know, they started working on Fleet, and people. It wasn't really intended to do all of this, but people kind of wanted that out of it. And they sort of reposition as a way to bootstrap uh, Kubernetes. Um, but I don't. You know, I don't even think that is necessary. Um, so, you know, part of it is um, ridiculous requirements. Um, that a lot of large organizations have. It's the reality of it. But then also not having good composable <laughs> software that they can actually kind of pick and choose from. But then also not taking the time, both, both on the, the integrator side, but um, you know, it's more the responsibility of the vendors that should be taking the time to really understand how to simplify things um, into composable orthogonal things. Um, and the fact that people have to run Mesos and Kubernetes suggests that maybe Kubernetes is not, you know, the ultimate thing that it's you know some people think it is. Yeah, we'll do one last question and then because uh, we have to move on with stuff as well. So, so I know I, I asked you this earlier at uh, when you gave this talk at Docker Austin, but and I found the answer really interesting. Would you mind sharing uh, your answer about the business model behind Gladder Labs with a wider audience, or is? Um, we'll do that in the open space Sounds uh, good. talk. Yeah, because yeah, it's a long conversation. Yeah, it's. Interesting, you should check it out. Cool. All right, thank you very much.